Welcome to the Apiary Department at the Crawford County Fair. This is uh, Department 49. At the Crawford County Fair, we have about uh, 20. We have 19 different exhibit areas where we can, where people can exhibit honey products. So we're gonna we're gonna go through this um, kind of like a, what a judge would do, and what we do when things are entered into the fair. So our most common entry is extracted honey. And as this light bar shows, we have different, uh, different colors of honey. When you come into the fair or any fair, you'll see honey is separated into different color categories. That is because different flower sources produce a different nectar and different flavors. So it would not be fair to compare a dark honey and a light honey because they're obviously different. So we want to compare kind of apples to apples. So we, we segregate them into uh, color categories. Uh, the way we do that is called the fun scale. It's P, it's, it's a strange spelling, P-F-U-N-D. It's a fun scale, it's on a light meter type of thing. And at the different separations, we uh, establish what category they'll go into. Now all the people don't necessarily know, they do their best guess at home because they don't have a comparison. So we have the, the ability at the fair and even at the Pennsylvania Farm Show to put the honeys into the correct category if they don't show up that way. And it, that's, that's perfectly works with a fair. Um, I brought in a couple of examples of honeys that look, look very, very close to one another. And as an example, we can take, use our light bar, and we can see that that is between those colors just by eye and even lighter there. So we, that one we would categorize pretty readily. This other one, this other one looks just a little bit darker than that, but it still could be on the borderline. So what we do, what we, we were able to do, I took a, I had taken a sample, a sample from one of those containers, and we have what's called a fund meter, and then we've calibrated it with, to zero. We'll place that in there, and we'll read it. This digital device has saved a lot of aggravation for me, because previous to the, the digital ability to do that, it was still very much a guessing game. So we did our best, and um, it always feels like a little bit unfair, and even, uh, you know, you, you just don't know if you got it in the right category. So you try to do the best for, for the exhibitors. So this, if you can see the scale, the scale came in at 60 on the fund meter. And if we go up here to the scale, it actually is between the 50 and the 85. So it would be properly categorized in the light amber class. And that's how we break some of the, these ties. This is even before we judge it. This is just uh, entry into the, the fair before the judges even look at it. So now, before the judges get here, we categorize, we put everything in its proper class. Now, when the judges come in the following day, uh, we bring exhibits on, in on Friday evening, Saturday morning, then uh, Saturday late morning, we start about 11 o'clock, we start to uh, judge things. Now the, the judge, the first thing they're going to do, well a lot of times what they're going to do is they're, we want to see, if we can see, we want to see fill levels. Some of the places where we're, we're uh, judged on are fill levels. Maybe with that background, we can see some fill levels. And 
this, this set of jars is, is filled nicely. You don't see an air gap. These ones you can see one actually is probably the one that I took the sample out of. But we also put a sticker on this. If we pull the sample out, we'll put a sticker on the side. That way the judge knows that it's the one that we pulled the sample out and uh, the fill level may not be correct. So we want to, it's one of the things the every, every uh, entry gets a scorecard. It's a little, just a category, categories where it's, it's uh, judged. So the judge will look at the fill levels and then uh, they'll set the jars where they can look at them, open them all. And first thing they're going to do is look at the inside of the lid. Inside lid is telling us if it was tipped or turned. And these are all nice, somewhat nice and clean. This one has a little bit of foam in it, and a little foam in the top of the top of the honey. These are not things that uh, are going to affect the quality of the honey, but for a show. For a show, we're looking at something as, um, as close to perfect as you can get. If you were a customer walking into a store and you saw foamy honey versus a nice clean top, you might have a tendency to buy the, the one with looks looks better in appearance. There's really nothing wrong with this, but for the sake of a show, it's uh, it, it's it's points where the judge will take off. And there's also, the foam is really just air bubbles that come out from the bottling process. And in the process, these are not heavily filtered. So you will get a little bit of pollen along in there. And so that's what, the, that's what we're seeing. So, and those will all count for points. The next thing the, the judge is gonna do is we, we're gonna check the moisture level. So we have a, this is a refractometer. In uh, Pennsylvania, well, uh, the honey standard nationwide is for it to be 18.6 or less in moisture. If it's higher than that, it has a possibility of fermenting and it's not something that we would make marketable. So we just, Take a sample and drop it in, drop it on the lens, close it, hit go. This is another thing with the digital age has made it much simpler. And I'm not sure we can read that, but that, that one is 19.5. So it's a little bit high. Well, yes, it's actually disqualified because it's 19.5. I guess I brought in a good sample to show you what not to do. So that one's 19.5. That would be disqualified at that point because it's too high. And another thing we need to do is um, keep the lids on most of the time because honey is lacking in moisture and it'll actually draw moisture out of the, out of the air on a moist day like we have today. A lot of humidity. Um, so, we're, the other, the next thing we're gonna we're gonna look at, we're looking at uh, we looked at, at some of the cleanliness. We're also looking at uh, what's in the jar. Oh, I need to step back just a minute. At the point where we do a, a moisture sample, that sample, the judge will generally take enough enough honey that he can put the sample on and then taste it. They do taste it. Generally, it's not downgraded for flavor unless there's something really objectionable about it. Like you can, might be able to taste fermentation or just some odd flavor that doesn't belong there or something that might uh, you know, make you not like it for some reason. So we, we do judge it for flavor. It's not scored, it's generally not points off unless it's something really strange. Um, but it, then we're going to go over here. This is a, called a polariscope. 
And what it is, it's a polarized, has two polarized lenses in it. Polarized lenses I'll, I'll take this diffused light and they straighten it out. So we have vertical polarized, polarized lens and a horizontal polarized lens, and it makes a very straight light. And then when in doing that, it makes, you can see shadows. And this, that one actually just looks pretty good. You can see shadows and if there's lint or bubbles or crystals, you'll be able to see them in there. That one actually, it looks a little cloudier once you get it in there. I'll have to go back to my, the ones that I already disqualified myself on. There was one, I could see it with the, I could see it myself, but when you put it in here, it's a little more pronounced. There's a little, there's actually honey on the outside of the jar on the side. And that's another thing with the cleanliness that the judges are looking for. So each category would get a score and then we would score them to total up the scores. And uh, at the end of the, end of the judging of that category, sometimes we'll get a tie, which is, leaves the world a little, so, so the judges will go back and rejudge it again and look at different categories that they, they uh, might be able to take point or add point or whatever they do. Um, I think that's pretty much where we are on the extracted honey. Uh, the next thing we're going to move on to is uh, a frame of honey. So we have a frame of honey. This is a somewhat newer exhibit in a lot of shows. Uh, we're, we're used to seeing comb honey in the sections, but people don't generally get an opportunity to see a full frame. This is exactly as it comes out of the hive. So when we're looking at a full frame of honey, we, again, there's, there's some presentation that we're looking for in the container. Uh, so it's nice and we don't just wrap it up with, with uh, shrink wrap and call it good. We want it to be presentable. And what is we're looking for, and this, this is actually one of mine that we took to the farm show, but you can see that there's no, there's only two empty cells on that entire side. And it's very white wax. There's only an empty cell on each corner. So that's, that's pretty hard to find. But uh, you can also see, one of the things we're looking for is uh, uniformity of appearance. So in uncapped cells, those get scores. Uh, leaky, leaky cells, there's actually a little bit of leak in here. It's, you can see it's watery it's out over time. Some of this will kind of seep. Like I say, it, it'll draw moisture to itself out of the air and uh, it'll get wetter. So we end up with a little bit of moisture. And we're looking for, it's hard to tell granulation in something like this because we don't have a cross section you can't see the extracted honey um, and travel stains there's something called travel stains so as these are stacked in a hive the bees are moving from one box to the other they can actually track debris and pollen and just they can make little what we call travel stains in there so we're looking at a lack of travel stains so that would, there we would have uh, judged our, our frames. We get quite a nice display of those. That's nice for the, for the visitors. Uh, but generally, we have different classes of comb honey, which we have in here. I only have two, two uh, on display today, but we have, uh, I believe there's three, three categories of uh, Comb. There's also a round one that 
very difficult to build. Bees don't like being restricted to a size. They want the whole thing to work with. It's much easier. They don't like being restricted. So, which is what we actually do with this style. And this is, well, let's, let's do the, this is cut comb. So cut comb is a honeycomb out of the frame. And we have like a cookie cutter or a very sharp knife and we uh, cut it to fit in these containers. And that's called cut comb. It's, uh, you don't wanna flip it over because it'll flop to the other side. But the things we're looking for, we're looking at the wax. Again, we're looking at the color and uniformity. We're looking for a nice edge. This one doesn't quite fit the box quite right. It's got some pieces that aren't. Again, it doesn't take away from the quality of the product. It's just the appearance. The nicer appearance, the, the more saleable it is. We're looking for um, so another, another uniformity thing. Uh, so one side of this comb is, is thicker than the other. If you have, compared to something more perfect, this would take less points. We also look for um, loose honey, drained honey in the bottom. It should be as dry as possible. It shouldn't be sitting in, uh, in honey. It's not intended to be that way. So those are uh, different uh, things that we're looking for. We also weigh, weigh these entries. We'll have a small scale and we'll weigh them so to see if they're uniform in weight. Honey is, is sold by weight and it goes back to comb honey back when, uh, you know, 100, 200 years ago and before that, it, when people purchased honey, they go to a local market and they buy honey and uh, they would weigh it out. So they would weigh it on a balance scale because the honey had all the comb. Comb honey, extracted honey like, what, like what's in the jar is uh, n the 20th century thing. So in the early 1900s, they found creative ways and means to extract honey. And, uh, but we still use the same weight method. So we, we sell it by weight. Uh, this is a 16 ounces of honey. It's 16 ounces in weight, not volume. So it's an important thing to know because it, uh, it's confusing, but there's a history behind it and that's why it's done that way. So we look for uniformity in weight. Uh, we, we categorize them in basically two colors. And uh, again, it's, this goes back to a judgment subjective call because we don't have a scale to, to measure that, those colors. Uh, generally, we don't get a lot of variations coming in, so it's not really too much of an issue. This style is called a hog hog half comb. It's, it's a section honey. You put these plastic cassettes in the hive and the bees actually build right in there. It's never, the honey is never tampered with ever. And you can see it's, it's all built from one side versus two sides. So the bees build it all from one side. It's very deep where a normal frame like what's in there the bees build it from both sides. So this is built from one side. It's, a, it's kind of a, a neat process and very clean. Uh, there's, to process it out of the hive, you basically take the, we just add a cover to it. It comes out of the hive like that. There's four in a row. And we clean the outside because it gets a little wax and whatnot on there. And then we, we just put a cover on it and it's a very nice product. Again, we're looking at uh, some uniformity. If we could set those up. And in these, because these are actually last year's, there's some crystallization taking place in there. And those would take points off. So if you're, even if, even if it, 
We take exhibits from one year to the next year. So beginning Jan September 1st, you, if you build it, made it last September, it would be eligible for this year. But sitting over time, all honeys will crystallize. Uh, some just crystallize faster than others. Uh, it depends on how, where it's stored. Uh, sometimes we'll uh, slow that process down by putting it in a freezer because it won't, it's really kind of not a real good sight on that one. But we can freeze it, we can freeze it and it won't uh, crystallize. It'll, it just slows everything down. So, and then one other category, this is probably not a real good example because it's cloudy, but this is called um, chunk honey. So we take a chunk of comb and put it in a jar and uh, fill it with honey and it's sold as chunk honey. So it's, a, it's kind of a, the best of both worlds. Some people like the comb honey to, to eat, but they like the liquid honey. So this is a little combination of both. These have a tendency to crystallize and there's not a lot we can do with it uh, to bring it back to liquid. If, if a jar of honey the jar of honey crystallizes, it only takes about 120 degrees. You can put it in a, in a, a lighted window, you can put it on the dash of your car, it'll, it'll liquefy. But if you do that with this product, we have wax in there and wax will melt at uh, about 150 degrees. So when it starts getting wimpy, it'll all just separate itself. So to have a nice product like that, it's hard, it's kind of hard to keep it crystallized or keep it nice and marketable. So there we have some of our honey products. Now we're going to move into waxes. Waxes are judged first on color. And what we're looking at, if we look at the frame, of honey, we see that the cappings are very nice and white. That is the perfect world um, for wax. So the lighter the wax, the less impurities is in it. Um, we never get white, you, you never get a white block of wax unless it's been bleached. Um, but it's always going to bring in some honey color and some just age and old stuff, but the, ideally the lighter is better. Uh, these, these two blocks are considered commercial, commercial blocks. Uh, so if you were just a, in production, honey production, you would you just mold them up. They need to be at least three pounds, no less than three pounds. And just as a point of reference, it takes about, uh, for every 100 pounds of honey that are, is, that's extracted, you get one pound of wax. So each of these blocks is representing about 300 pounds of honey. Uh, a lot of our beekeepers are hobbyists. They don't keep, they don't, they don't produce that much. And so large blocks of uh, wax are a little, it's not something you see a lot of in the shows because not a lot of people can produce that much. And what we're, what we're looking for on this, we're looking for stuff that'll settle out, like the dirt and debris will settle out into the bottom. And we'll look at the bottom. We want to see if there's some, wax has a tendency to crack when it cools too fast. So we're looking for cracks and uh, imperfections. We're looking for consistency. And the judges will pick up on little imperfections. We'll move to candles. We have candles can be either molded or dipped. These are a molded candle. They have a, a seam where the mold came together. And we're looking for uniformity. We're looking for a, a nice finish. Uh, these are not quite the same length. That would be some points off. Um, 
looking for the finish of the wick, nice and crisp. There's your little fuzzy. Again, it doesn't hurt the function of the candle, but for the sake of a show, if somebody takes the time to put more effort into it, they should be recognized for it. And that's, that's what we're doing. And uh, wax also has a tendency to pick up any kind of dust and odors too. So we, we handle, we try to handle all our, our uh, exhibits with, with gloves on. This is not something just for the sake of uh, today's COVID problem. This is something that we, this is our standard uh, process. Because we, we can, it'll pick up hand smudges real easily. Uh, you can pick up the aroma off of it. Honey or wax will pick up aroma. It'll pick up odors that don't belong there. If you do this in a room that has some other, well, I guess the, my, the most telling example I could remember is uh, we had had some honey and the honey judge, or some wax and the honey judge came in and they're smelling it. It's like, oh, it's just an odd smell. I couldn't place it for the longest time. And then uh, knowing where the exhibitor lived, I understood that they uh, stored some of their, their wax in, in the milk house. Well, the milk house picked up all the barn odor. And you can imagine that, uh, okay, now we, now we know where that odor came from. It uh, belonged to a cow. So just a point of interest. So we're, we've judged, so uh, candles are judged. We also have a category of molded and, and designed. Again, it doesn't necessarily, creativity counts in this, but again, they're looking at the same characteristics as, uh, as a block of wax. We're looking for color. We're looking for nice and glossy. We're looking for uh, cracks. This has a little inconsistency in colors through here. It may be hard to pick up on the camera inconsistency there. The bigger the mold, the more complicated it gets. This is, this is actually combined with several molding processes to come to a, con one product. But you can see different colors in the wax too. So the frog is a little different color than the, what's in the puddle. But it's creativity. Beeswax, historically back in uh, you know, the time when we are in the Bronze Age, they would use it for uh, a base. So you'd make a, you'd bury that, bury that in sand, pour your bronze in, or any shape. You could make little figurines and things, and, but you pour your bronze in there and, and it basically the bronze replaces all the beeswax. The beeswax just melts out and blows out. And this would be completely like bronze, right? So that's, that's where some of this design idea originated with, with beeswax. I think, let's see what, that's there. Um, just, as, just as a note on where we are this year, with uh, beekeeping, so we had a fairly mild winter in 2019 to 2020. We had a lot of survivors. It was pretty, a lot of people had pretty decent survival. Uh, bees were a little bit, um, they actually got started with milder weather. And w bees like about 40 degrees. 40 degrees is, is cold enough that they don't fly but it's, it's warm enough that they can stay loose in the cluster. They also can start to produce uh, brood in, in eggs in February and March. And the only, <clears throat> the only problem with that is they all start, start using a lot more food. So we had a, some starvation issues as we were breaking into April and May if, if beekeepers weren't adding a supplement, but the bees in general, seemed to come through winter pretty well. Uh, so we saw a lot more swarms this year. Uh, 
We also, mites, mites are still, it's a parasite for, on honeybees. It's still our primary issue. Uh, some of that early brood production led to higher mite levels uh, through the summer right now because uh, the mites reproduce in the, in the cell with the larva. They feed on the larva, that's why it's an issue. Uh, but so far, uh, the season seems to be not the best, but not the worst. It's, a, it's been a pretty good season. The dry really hasn't bothered the, the bees. Uh, any day that's not raining, they're out working. Uh, so overall, it's been a pretty, pretty decent year for production. And so we're looking, looking uh, already, this is August, we're looking at getting our bees ready for winter. So we want to make sure that they're clean and healthy going into the fall goldenrod honey flow in September. And so at the end of September, they, we basically, they've got to be ready for winter because there's no more natural food coming in. There's a, a few flowers at the end of September and October, but not enough to, to really add to the hive weight. So we're looking at, uh, so we start thinking, start gearing in our mind to get these bees ready for, get them prepared now for winter. We want healthy bees. Honeybees live about six to eight, you know, four to six weeks in the summertime when they're flying. So this life cycle, the bees that we want to produce honey in September are gonna be born this month. So we want them as healthy and clean in August to be ready for that honey flow in September. And additionally, that clean, healthy bee going on into September is gonna raise more clean, healthy bees going into winter. In, in the winter, we're looking at about four to six months that they need to live. They generally don't live that long. It's just a challenge, depending on how cold it is. But uh, so they change their, 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 their body. We call them summer bees and winter bees. Winter bees go into winter with uh, more fat bodies and to store nutrition through the, through the winter. But it's, it's a continuous challenge uh, keeping bees. And uh, we have a, somewhere close to, I want to say, 100 or 250 uh, beekeepers in the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association. Uh, so, it, and we cover basically four to five counties, Warren, Erie, Crawford, Venango, Mercer County are all participate in our, in our Beekeepers Association. Uh, we weren't able to complete all the classes that we had offered or we wanted to offer this spring because things got shut down in, uh, in March boat. But there's still a lot of interest. Penn State uh, did online classes for free during April and they had a unbelievable amount of response to that. So uh, it's a challenge, it's, it's not for everybody, but uh, it's, it's out there and can be done. And you can, it can help you. We're, we're kind of in a situation where Bees don't have a lot of natural habitat. They, they're a cavity dweller. They like to live in, the, in a cavity. And we think of them in a hollow tree, but there's not a lot of hollow trees. Uh, so the beekeeper's hive is really the replacement. So the, when we have more small beekeepers and we spread out, then we're helping kind of everybody with all the local pollination. Just a few points to go with. But I think that's about it uh, for now. Just one other project that we're on at the Northwest Beekeepers. We're looking for, we're also in a queen improvement project. It's Pennsylvania statewide. There's not a lot of, we have some pretty decent participation. But we're looking at different genetic strains of honeybees. Some are more more prompted to rid themselves of mites on their own, they'll actually pick them off of each other. And we've been able to select those bees. We're involved with uh, uh, studies between Penn State and Purdue University. And we've got some project sites. We have two project sites in, uh, in Crawford County right now. 
and we're going to monitor these for two years. There's five uh, queen subspecies, so to speak, and uh, we don't know. There, it's a blind study. We only have a color on each queen, so we don't know exactly where the genetic strain is from. But we're going to compare data over two years and see if we can draw some more conclusions on on that process. Uh, we've been working with the Ernst Conservation Seed as uh, a location for mating yard because we I have a lot of hives on the Ernst Conservation Seed that are all this genetic strain. So they're all mite resistant and survivor bees. And so we're using that as a mating yard to just help propagate the the, the bees. I, we could probably go on for an hour, but we don't need to do that. So it's just some, some highlights of what we're doing. And uh, again, thank you for being a part of the Crawford County Fair. And, and uh, if you, we're always looking for exhibitors. This, it's a nice show. It's a local show. And uh, it's a friendly show. Normally during the week, we will have volunteers back behind the rail We'll have a display of live bees, and uh, they'll talk to you all week long. We have a great, great group of volunteers. So I want to thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next year.